As we attend now to the reading and the hearing of God's holy word, let us bow for a word of prayer. Open our hearts and our minds, O God, as we open this thy book, which points to Jesus Christ. Open our hearts and our minds that we might hear thy word for us today, and in hearing, we might obey. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Two passages for today, the first from the book of Exodus, chapter 17, verses 1 through 7. Listen now for the word of God. From the wilderness of Sin, the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water and the people complained against Moses and Moses and said to him, why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massah and Meribah. These are two words that mean test and quarrel. Because the Israelites quarreled and tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? The gospel lesson for today is the temptation of Jesus story in Matthew's version, and it is Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Listen again now for God's word. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, again it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan! For it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. Friends, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A little over 15 years ago, the son of a friend of mine in Texas was doing business in Boston. And he woke up one morning realizing that he hadn't gotten his wake-up call at the hotel. And he looked at his watch and realized that he had missed his plane that was to fly from Logan Airport to LaGuardia. And he ran down 
upset, angry, and began berating the poor young woman behind the reception desk. The whole room saw this going on in the lobby, and he continued to yell at her and looked up at the TV behind her, and suddenly something stopped him cold. He watched, as everyone else did, as a plane went into one of the twin towers, and he realized suddenly that was the plane he was supposed to be on. So he apologized to the woman and thanked her for forgetting the birthday wake-up call that day. We are all impatient about this and that. We want this and that. We want it right now. And that's the way the Israelites were. They wanted some water. And they were upset with Moses and they were quarreling. And Moses, their pastor, didn't know what to do with them. They were testing God. They were putting God to the test in the way they yelled at Moses. We do that all the time, don't we? We test God. We test one another. We test our friends, our family members. When I was a teenager, I tested my parents all the time, especially as a preacher's kid. Maybe the teenagers here test their parents' patience every once in a while. I don't know. When our actor son David was 12 or 13 and it was the beginning of Lent, I said, David, what are you giving up for Lent? He thought for a moment, he said, cleaning up my room. <laughs> no, no, I don't think that quite works, David. You've got to give up something you like. I was with a friend the other day and we were having coffee together and I asked him, what are you giving up for Lent? I, said, I don't know, I've never thought about that. So he turned it back on him, he said, what are you giving up for Lent? And I said, you know, I, I wanted to learn how to be a better listener, so I think for Lent, I'm going to give up talking so much. He said, it'll be kind of hard for a preacher, won't it? And I said, well, not in the pulpit, but in other situations, one-on-one -on -one with people or in groups. I think I'm just going to give up talking so much for Lent. How about you? He said, yeah, I think that sounds good. I'm going to do the same thing. And then we sat and stared at each other. We <laughs> didn't have anything to say, you know. The Israelites should have given up talking so much because they were constantly working themselves into a tizzy. You ever work yourself into a tizzy? Yeah, I see some nods. Is that a word? It ought to be if it isn't. The, the, the Israelites worried and fretted so much that their pastor Moses said, don't you remember that God brought us out of slavery in Egypt? If God can bring us out of slavery from Pharaoh, well, what makes you think that a little water supply is going to throw God off? But no, no, they had to complain and gripe, and they couldn't stop. Hold that thought for a moment and fast forward with me now to Jesus in the wilderness being tempted by the devil. And I want you to think for a moment about point of view now, the way a, an author in a novel has a point of view from which you are hearing the story. Bible study leaders and preachers and Sunday school teachers are always thinking about the point of view from which we are going to look at a particular text. If you were here last Sunday, you will remember that Tom Long preached on uh, the rich man and Lazarus. And did you notice how he had us look at the story from the point of view of the rich man? Now, in this story, immediately, we want to identify with Jesus because we get tempted, we get tested. We want to identify with Jesus being tempted and tested out there in the wilderness. But I want to submit to you a very radical idea that a better way to find point of view in this text is for us to identify with Satan in this text, putting God to the test. And before you lose your mind over this, just realize it's truer than you think. We're all fallen angels like Satan, and we're always pushing our agendas on God. We're always quoting scripture, usually out of context, trying to get God to do something for us or for our world. And that's the role that Satan plays in this story. See, Satan is not just this devil, uh, Halloween devil with, uh, you know, a red cape and horns. No, the devil is really all those of us who try to obstruct 
or resist God's will. And what God is trying to intend for our lives, uh, not to mention all of creation, it's really all of us. It's not just those who attack mosques and synagogues, as bad as they are. And I want to say that publicly. That is as bad as you can get. But it's not just those. We all identify with Satan in some way or another. It's all of us, clergy included, every one of us. So I want you to see this story from the point of view of Satan this morning. And what is the personification of evil trying to get Jesus to do? Well, to, to, to worry too much and, and, and not trust God and, and to forget about God. Uh, and how does he do it? Well, he's got three different temptations. And let's peel back the cover of these temptations to understand what's really going on here. The first one is rocks into bread, stones into bagels. Oh, it's a wonderful, it sounds good, doesn't it? You know, feed the poor, eliminate world hunger. It's very seductive. But there's something missing, isn't there, here? What is the temptation here? It is the temptation to trivialize the nature of God's work and make it smaller than it really is. In theology, we call it theological reductionism. And when Jesus said, human beings do not live by bread alone, he wasn't saying that feeding the poor and the hungry is a bad thing. He's simply saying it's not the only thing. And people who try to make caring for the poor the only thing that the church does are actually playing the role of Satan. Just as those of us who think we don't need to care for the poor, we just come to church and forget about the poor, we are also playing the role of Satan. Why? Because with the two great commandments that Jesus pulls from Deuteronomy and Leviticus, we are to love God and to love neighbor, and out of our study of the word of God, we care for our neighbor who is poor and who is hungry. Or maybe working with the poor, we are led to scripture, which helps us understand why we are caring for the poor. So you sing in the choir, but you also work in a soup kitchen or open door. You are a stair tutor, but you also go to Bible study and come to worship on Sunday. Both are important, but see, Satan doesn't get that. Satan only deals in half-truths, just half of it. And unfortunately, lots in the church operate that way too. So the first temptation is rocks into bread, stones into bagels. The second one is trying to turn God into a divine bellhop who answers our every whim, does whatever we want, and put, put him in a real, real important place. Uh, you could just hear the devil saying, amaze the motley mob, Jesus. Jump from the pinnacle of the temple like Superman, and they will be amazed. But Jesus doesn't want to go that route. You know, testing God this way is a, is a way of, of not putting trust in God. It's, it's a way of having a fundamental doubt that God is even present. And that's what happened to the Israelites. They said, is God even really here? It's a question many Jews asked during the Holocaust, but not Elie Wiesel. Elie Wiesel understood God is present even in the midst of this hell we're dealing with here. The Israelites were grumbling and complaining with God because they just... They just couldn't get it. They, they thought God would provide for us, and where's the water? Now, we understand because we all experience a kind of absence of water in our lives, don't we? I mean, it's a metaphor for the hard times, the desert times in our lives. What is it for you? The death of a loved one that still hurts the dull ache lingers. You, you thought you heard her voice around the corner, but she wasn't there. Or you, you thought you got a glimpse of him, but no, it was just in your mind. The dull ache of the absence of water. Will Enno has a new play in New York called Wakey Wakey. It was just reviewed in the New York Times. Fascinating sounding play. His main character is named Guy, who is a kind of everyman who is dying in a wheelchair on the stage. 
he is waxing eloquently about death and how we all die. It's almost a kind of stand-up existentialism, or, or I should say a sit-down existentialism in his case, as he helps us understand that, yes, everyone dies, but each one of us dies individually and personally. And there's this one chilling line, he says, that was in the latest review. I thought I had more time. I thought I had more time. Well, we all think that at some time or another, don't we? What is absence of water for you? Is it discouragement or feeling down, something that can happen even to preachers and everyone in this room? What is the absence of water? Whatever it is for you, you want God to fix it, and you want God to fix it just now, right now, like the Israelites. But God doesn't want us to put God to the test. So if the first temptation is to turn the stones into bagels and the second is to turn God into a divine bellhop, what is this third temptation? It is to tempt Christ to make a name for himself without going through the sacrificial journey to the cross. All gain, no pain. But he doesn't buy it. No, no, he, he refuses to grab the brass ring that will make him like God uh, the way Adam and Eve and all of us try to do. The devil says, oh, no, you can try, please. No, no, says Jesus. Quit putting God to the test. Quit trying to play God yourselves in your own lives. We all try to do that, don't we? Jesus says, I accept you as you are. Someone was telling me not long ago that her husband gave her a card I think it was around Valentine's Day, and it was a Mr. Rogers type card, and on the front it said, I accept you just the way you are. I like you the way you are. Don't change anything about yourself. And she opened the card, and inside it said, but for God's sake, don't get any worse. <laughs> Jesus says, I accept you. You don't have to put God to the test. You don't have to keep trying to play God. Just trust God. Quit worrying so much about him, fretting like the Israelites so much about everything. After the service this morning, someone came through and said, boy, I really needed that today. I'm a professional worrier, he said. Are you that? Are you a professional worrier? You think you can keep ships afloat by worrying about them? Then you trust God. And the people who help us understand how to trust God are the ones that are so rich and profound in their deep faith. I saw children, little children, all over Rwanda, all over South Africa, little black children who have so much faith, so much joy. They have nothing, and they trust God. My grandma Carl was that way, pioneer woman in Oklahoma, hands gnarled up from arth arthritis from her early 20s, crippled, so much faith. She trusted God. We were with some friends the other day, and one of them was knitting. And it was a tiny little ring. And I asked Jane later, what, what, what is she knitting? She said, that's a bonnet for a stillborn child. What does a stillborn child need for the bonnet? Oh, it's for the mother. So when they bury the stillborn child, they'll have a little dress and a little bonnet. It's a ministry in their church. They call it angel dresses. And you should see the faith and the trust of God of these mothers with stillborn children. This morning, as I came in to open the Bible for the scriptures, Beth King came walking in early. Beth, what are you doing here so early? I'm fixing the communion. I said, Beth, your mother just died. Dot Boyd, Rusty and Beth's mother, she just died. Are you okay? Yes, I, I think I'll be all right. And we talked for a moment. And I said, what are, you, what are you doing? She said, somebody asked me, are you, do you still want to do communion? Do you still want to prepare communion today? She said, yes, I need to. You see, I need to go on. In the face of death, if we continue to trust God, then we can. 
go on. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know what it's like to have that kind of trust and to let your worries go? To God. That's what Jesus and Moses are trying to get the people to do. <sighs> Several years ago, I had just finished lecturing at a seminary in Trivandrum at the bottom tip of India. And then it was time to take the 12 hour train ride back up to Papa Nasseri on the west coast of the state of Kerala. I was by myself and it was a little scary. I got in my bunk and looked across, and there was a man looking at me with a big smile. It kind of unnerved me. I didn't know what to do with him. I got more and more nervous, and I, 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 I didn't know if I could sleep. I slept very fitfully and fretfully that night. I prayed, God, protect me. Please don't allow this man to steal anything from me. And I even put my passport and my wallet under my pillow, and I held everything close and tight. And the next morning, I tried to rub the sleep from my eyes as the sun peeking through the windows caused a kind of temporary blindness and I looked over and there was that man just sitting there grinning. So I greeted him in Malayalam and in perfect English he said, your Malayalam is excellent. Are you okay? I said, yeah, I guess I am. I said, what do you do for a living? He said, I'm a policeman. He said, I looked at you last night, and you looked really nervous, and I decided you needed some protection, so I just stayed here all night to make sure nobody bothered you. Like an angel. And my worrying came to an end. When are you going to stop putting God to the test? You know, maybe instead of giving up talking too much. I really need to give up worrying too much for Lent. Or maybe even better than that, for the rest of my life. I hope you can too. God bless you all.